Hi, Kalani. Oh, good morning. You truly are in a class by yourself, Kalani. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> Morning, Catherine. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. All right, it's 9.30, we'll get started. Uh, so what I was going to do today was go over a heating curve example. It's going to be pretty similar to what you're going to see on the actual test. So the idea is that you'll be given a heating curve. And I, th I can't entirely, no, no, that's right. I'm thinking now, uh, yeah, you are going to have to, I think, find all the values here. On the, on the heating curve in the example you do. In this specific example, some of the values are actually given. So we're only really calculating three of the values that are uh, one, two, and three. So we talked about this the other day when I was referencing the heating curve of water. And what I had said was that for the slopey parts, 
we're using Q equals MC delta T because we're actually seeing a, a change in temperature of a single phase, which as you can see here, we've got solid, then liquid, then gas. So those phases are given to you. And there's a good reason for them to be given to you and I'll explain that in a second. For the flat plateau parts, the Q value is the either the delta H of vaporization or it could be the delta H of fusion. And that's multiplied by the number of moles. Now in that instance, there is no change in temperature. And it's pretty clear as to why. I mean, you've got temperature on this axis. If you've got a straight line here, there is no change in temperature. Now what's going on on the slopey parts is that we're just heating a single phase. But on the plateau part, what we're doing is simply changing the phase. And during the phase change, there is no change in temperature. So all of this data here, you'll be given. Right? So you're given all of this data right here. Now, when you start out doing a problem like this, I recommend, you don't have to do this, but I recommend doing this. You'll have temperature on the side, you'll have energy down here. Kind of just draw a facsimile of, of what I've got over here. It doesn't have to be all the, all the different bits and pieces. But the most important thing is to put some numbers here on the temperature axis so you know exactly what the heck's going on. So the first thing, and this is in the question, you're ask, it's asking for the total energy required in joules to bring 170.00 grams of the compound X, which is just a, a fictitious compound. And I give you the molecular weight as well and I give you these temperature, I give you these temperature um, boundaries here. So we're starting at minus 20.0 degrees Celsius and going all the way up to 75.0 degrees. So down the bottom here, it's going to be minus 20.0. You know, I wish I had it for, sorry. Let me, I'll just put it down here. So that's going to be our starting point. Now the ending point is going to be up here and it's going to be 75.0 degrees Celsius. All right, I'm going to stop right there for a second. Does anybody have any questions so far about what I'm doing on this graph? Okay. Now the other important pieces of data we have are the melting point and the boiling point. Now these are the phase changes. Now melting point is going from solid to liquid. Boiling point is going from liquid to gas. The melting and boiling points are going to be where the plateaus are. So the melting point is going to be at minus 10.0 degrees. And the boiling point is going to be at 60.00 degrees. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, so you'll see why it's important that we do that as we go through, okay? So what we have to do is we have to find all of these different values on the slopey parts and on the flat parts. So we'll just start from the bottom here and we'll go for the first slopey part, which should be 3,400 joules, but I'm going to show you how that gets calculated. So number one, Q equals MC delta T because it's a slopey part. I've got this up here, right? The mass we're given in the problem, 170.00 grams. The C here, 
Well, you look at the phase and what we're looking at here is the heat capacity of solid X, which is 2.000 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And then we're looking at the temperature difference, which is going to be from minus 20 to minus 10, which is simply, whoops, which is simply 10.00, we'll make it 10.00 degrees. Does anybody have any questions? That should be 3,400 if I've calculated it correctly. Does anybody have any questions about that calculation? If you understand this as we go, it won't be too hard, I don't think. Any issues so far? Okay. Number two is, it, uh, well, actually what I should do, let me, so it's not so confusing, we'll do A, I'll do B here. And B is a flat part and it's going from solid to liquid. So the equation I'll use there is Q equals delta H. Now we need the delta H of fusion here. Fusion is going to always be from solid to liquid. Think of fusion as melting or, or freezing. But the opposite or the other one is the liquid to gas, that's the vaporization. That one's a little bit clearer because I think people are pretty much able to associate vapor with gas. So then that one's not as, uh, as unclear, I guess. We do, have, we do have the molecular weight and the mass here. So what I can tell is that we're looking at 2.00 moles. So the number of moles. So the delta H of fusion is the molar heat of fusion and it's 2.000 kilojoules per mole. And that's times the number of moles, which is 2.000 moles as well. Now we're looking for a value in kilojoules, sorry, in joules. So we are going to have to do a conversion along the way as well to get it into joules. So that would be, should be 4,000 joules. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, let's look at C. Now C, uh, this is A, but I'm pointing out now at the cursor. This is B. C is the next slopey part. Q equals MC delta T for that one. The mass, 170.00 grams. The C is going to be the heat capacity of the liquid. And that's given to you here, 3.000 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And delta T is the temperature change. Now you can see the importance of what we got here. So we've got 60.00 degrees Celsius down to minus 10. That difference is actually 70.00 degrees Celsius. All right, I'll stop there for a second. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> No, it seems could you could you give a a short explanation of how you did that again? I just got here. Okay. Well, what, which uh, which which part, David? The whole thing, or? Yeah, the the whole thing, if you could. All right. So the first thing I did have to move this over here somewhere else. It's not being very cooperative, there we go. 
So the first thing I did, oh, damn it, I hate this thing. It just moves around wherever it goes. I'm going to actually pop, I'm actually going to close this out. There we go. Put it somewhere else. There we go. So this is the, the problem. It's David, right? Who, who was asking that question? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're told how much you've got here, and then you're also told from where to where you want the energy calculated. So what I suggested is that you redraw the graph here and then put some temperature values on the on the y-axis, starting at minus 20 at the top and going to 75.0, sorry, so minus 20 at the bottom and 75.0 at the top. And then on the plateau parts, that's going to be melting, that's going to be vaporization. And what's going to happen there is that we're going to not see any temperature change. And those go, are going to be the melting point and the boiling point. And those are given over here. So those go in these specific locations on the graph. Are you okay with that so far? Yeah, yeah. The slopey parts are always Q equals MT delta T. And the flat parts are going to be either the delta H of vaporization or fusion multiplied by the number of moles because there is no temperature change on the flat parts. All that's happening is the phase is changing on the flat parts. So the first one I calculated uh, is because it's a slopey part is Q equals MC delta T. I use the mass given. I use the heat capacity of the solid, which is given over here as well, because it's solid, if you look at the graph. And then the temperature difference, which goes from minus 20, uh, 20 to minus 10, which is 10.00 degrees. Part B is the flat part here. And it's going to be the delta H of fusion because it's going from solid to liquid. And we multiply that by the number of moles, which we get from up here. It's 170.00 grams divided by 85.00 grams per mole. That'll give us the number of moles, which happens to be 2.000 moles. And then the other, the next slopey part is going to be Q equals MC delta T. This is going to be for liquid. So solid liquid gas. So we use the, the mass given multiplied by the heat capacity of the liquid, which is given and then multiplied by the temperature difference, which happens to be the temperature difference between the melting and boiling points, which happens to be in this case, 70.00 degrees. Is that okay? And that gets you your final answer. Well, you have to get, you have to get all of them first. We've only got three of them so far. And what we're what we're looking for is we're looking for what the slopes are, like the differences in heat on the graph. What are we looking for exactly? Well, looking at the question, calculate the total energy required in joules. Which which means okay. we have to we have to find the, the energy of each part. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So all you have to understand at this point is how I got those calculations to work. Okay. So D is a flat part. It's this one here. I know I've already calculated, but I'm just gonna show you where the calculation comes from. And that's going to be the Delta H of vaporization this time because we're going from liquid to gas. And that's multiplied by the number of moles. The heat of vaporization is given here and it's 3.000 kilojoules per mole. And again, that's multiplied by 2.000 moles times 1000 joules per kilojoule. And that comes out to be 6,000 joules. The last slopey part is for the gas. So that's going to be E. And that is Q equals MC delta T. And the mass there is 
I, again, still the same 170.00 grams. We're looking at the heat capacity of the gas, which is given. And that's multiplied by the change in temperature, which is going to be the difference between 75 and 60, which is 15. 15.00 degrees Celsius, which comes out to be 6375 joules. So after that, since we're looking for something in joules, we just add all of those values together, all five of them, and we come up with the total. Does anybody have any, any questions about any of this? So for this type of problem, what you're doing is you're doing Q equals MC delta T for the upward slopes, and then you're doing Q equals heat vapor, change in heat vaporization times or, or fusion. Mol, oh, okay, times moles for mm -hmm. the, the flatter parts. And we're using that to figure out the joules for, for each of the parts of the graph and then add them together to get the answer. That's right. All right, I got it. Okay. So let's take a look at what the, the test questions look like there. They don't look a whole lot different. You'll see. Here it is here. So what it's looking for again is this total energy. And the idea here is that you, you can see what you need to find. You need to find A, B, C, D, and E. And there's all the data which you'll need. You've got your, your mass, you've got your molecular weight. Yeah, and you've got the lower bound and the upper bound. And then you've got all the information that I explained earlier, the melting point, the boiling point, and then all of the heat capacities and the delta H of fusion and delta H of vaporization. And then you come up with your answer at the end. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody feel uncomfortable at all with the question? Really, I, I don't. I don't see it as being too big a deal. Now, the, the other thing I want you to remember is that for the actual test, there's a question at the end that allows you to put your work in. So I think it would be a really good idea, especially for this last one, to, to put in your work at the end, just in case you get something wrong and then you can get some partial credit for it. Now, if you don't show me what you've done, I have no way of knowing if you understood the problem or not. So that's what I would want you to do. And now sometimes I get some pushback from students. They say, oh, look, I don't want to type all that stuff in. Well, I say too bad because I don't want to deal with people sending me bits of paper that they've taken pictures of because they could easily change information on those bits of paper before they send them to me. So the only real solution I have to that is to have you type in the, type in the information. Then the idea would be if, if it gets marked wrong and you think you've done it right and you've shown the work, you alert me, you email me, you let me know. I go check it, I check your work, and then I give you the appropriate number of partial points or even full points 
if it's a, a very simple calculation error that you've done along the way. All right, does anybody have any questions at all about heating curves? I have a question. It's not yeah. about the heating curves. It was about um, entering your answers, you said. So uh, you want us to, on the final question of the test, there's a box to enter, enter words if your instructor wants you to. Mm -hmm. And what you want us to do is, do you want us to enter the calculations for each question on the test or for specific well, ones or what do you want us to do? Well, it's up to you. It's up to you, David. If you, if you have a... Um, I don't know if you're real confident in the question and you think, and you, you know you've got it right, then maybe you don't need to put that working down there. It's up to you. You put as much as you want. What I'm saying is if you don't put it down there and you get it wrong, I'll have no way of knowing why you got it wrong. Okay. But like I said, I always get, I always get pushback from students. Why? Because they don't want to be bothered typing the stuff in. But... I say too bad. If you want the partial credit, you're going to have to go to the effort. All right. Any other questions about heating curves? All right. Any general questions before I go? Before I start going through a test here, any general test questions? So. I kind of have a question and I, I, I've discussed this before, but I'm kind of comparing it to the grade book from test three. Okay. Um, so how the extra credit works. So okay. if I get, so if I don't do the extra credit, it won't count against me, but that if is I correct. do Okay. So I was looking at the grave curves and trying to do the math on it and everything like that and trying to figure out where the points were actually going. Well, so that's, okay. Well, I can, I can actually, that's, that's a good point. Let me show you how you can easily tell. Okay. Okay. I know it's a, it's a fairly convoluted grade book, but it is a very, uh, there's a, it's very con uh, comprehensive as well. You know, there's, there's a lot, a lot of information in the grade book that you can, that you have access to. Okay, let's have a look at grades. So this is how you see it as a student. And we're looking at test three here. So there's your, there's your test three grade there, right? Right. So what happens is, now this is all per the syllabus, you do each of these quizzes, these are all extra credit, every single one of them extra credit. I'm oh, sorry, this is test four, isn't it? I apologize, sorry. Test four. All of this is extra credit. The way it works out is all of this gets added up and then gets divided by two, and then that gets added to your test four score. Now, along the way, you can find out exactly how much extra credit you've done by looking at this grade item, test four complete. This gives you a running total of all the extra credit you've, you've gotten. Oh, is I it, see. Is that okay? Yes, that makes sense. That way you don't even have to add it all up yourself. It's already added up for you. Oh, so, uh, I didn't see that at the bottom. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, then of course you've got your letter grades after, and these are only valid after you've taken each, you know, all the assessments for everything, right? And that gives you a running grade, a letter grade, a running letter grade. And then after you've completed test four, then you can use this information to say, say exact, to find out exactly what you need on the final to get the grade you want. All is right. It, is it possible, because I've been looking at that down there, is it possible that you won't need to take the final or will everyone need to take the final? Oh, no, no, uh, per the syllabus, if you've got more than 90% on all four tests, then you already have an A and you don't have to take the final at all. If you have more than 80% on all four tests, then you can have a B without taking the final, but you can still take the final to try and get an A. But it, it has to, it's, it's based on the lowest score, not the average, Emily. Oh, your lowest test score? Yes. 
Okay. Which is based on these four up here, test one, test two, test three, test four complete. Okay. That's what, that's what the calculation's all based on. It's all done automatically. You know, I don't actually have to go in and do anything because I've, uh, I've, I've put in formulas to handle all of that. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? I have a question about the test four, a question on test four. Okay, okay. well, we'll get to that in a second because I'm about to go, I'm about to go through test four, okay? Okay. So uh, I'll just hold off for a second. Does anybody have any other grade book questions while I'm here? I think that's about it. Thank you for clearing that up. So like, basically I'm seeing all these scores right now and I'll, like if I see zeros, like say for the extra credit, they will be dropped in the grade book for the final probably, right? Well, not drop, just, just they don't enter into the calculation because they're zero. Okay, so when I'm looking for my final grade, I should look at the bottom table then, and that will give me everything I need. Yeah, this part here, yeah, the test one, okay. test one, test two, test three, four complete, yes. This, okay. sc this score here is what you should be, have your eagle eye focused on. Too easy. All right, thank you so much. But that being said, Roland, I think you'd be crazy not to do the extra credit. Oh, and for get sure. As, get as many points as you possibly can. Now remember the extra credit closes the day before the test is due, but you can do the test anytime. You don't have to wait till the day is due. So the test is gonna be due next Monday, but I would recommend getting it done earlier. Oh, so it will be done, it will be due Monday. Cause I was looking at the test too. It said it was due the 29th. Well, the that would be the extra credit, but I think the I think the test itself. Let me take a look. I think the test itself should be due on the thirtieth. Uh, no, it it says November 29th. At least oh, that's what I'm looking at. Okay, let, me, let me take a squeeze. Oh yes, all right. I think I had the same problem with test three. It was a it was set up a day a day later as well. All right, let me let me fix this right now because it should be on the thirtieth. Uh, that won't create an issue if I change it now. And all the extra credit should be due on Sunday. That should be due, all the extra credit should be due on the... Uh, okay, so now it's set for November 30th. And I'll look at the... I'm going to stop to share for a second, but I'll, uh, I'll come back to it in a minute. Yeah, I need to see all of this stuff that I'm going to do here. But I'm just check fixing the dates now on test four, making sure that the extra credit is due on the right date. We'll do that now so I don't forget. It's really important. Now it looks like they're all set up for yeah, 11.29, yeah. So they're already set up, so those will be good. It was just the test that needed to be changed to the 30th. All right, does anybody have any other questions? So just to clarify, to find out our final grade after we take the test four, we're going to look at some of tests one through four, and that should be our final grade. No, actually, it'll it'll tell you. It'll be, I'll show you. I'll show you in a sec. Here we are. Let me go back to do a student. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So what I would do is I would look at the letter grade as of test four. Okay. Now that will take into account everything that I talked about, believe it or not. That's what you'll look at. So if it says A, you have an A in the class. If it says B, you have a B in the class. If, okay. you, have, if you have C or less, you, you know you're gonna have to take the final. Okay. And then do you know um, it, 
have you looked at the percentages of the students who've taken the SSI yet or no? Oh, um, not of late, I haven't. Uh, so I, I, well, if, you, if you're burning, burning to know, let's, uh, oh, actually, I can't check it on this computer. I'll, I'll check it after class, Emily. Okay, thank you. All right. If I, if I don't, I, I think it was, uh, to, from memory, I think it was pretty close. So I think I'm probably going to go ahead and, in fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it and fix it now so that you can, uh, so you can all have that. Thank you. So the, the way that works, it, it doesn't get added to a specific score. It just gets added to your aggregate score from tests one through four. Okay, so I don't want people emailing me and saying, well, I want this added to X. It ain't going to happen. But it is going to go into the, it is going to go into the, oops. It is going to go into the actual calculation uh, but being being completely honest here, it really only helps people who are taking the final. It actually doesn't really help people who don't have to take the final. Okay. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Is the the final grade like weighted, or is it just worth a hundred points flat out? I, I believe it's just worth a hundred points. It's worth twenty percent of the of the grade. In total, it's worth, okay. a, it's worth a test. It also replaces one of the lower test grades if it's if it's higher than all your tests, then if it's higher than at least one of your test grades, it will replace it. And again, that's that's all done by calculation as well. So, when you when you say replace, what does that mean? Does it mean that that test grade essentially gets revoked, and so that that it has no no longer has any effect on your grade? How does that work? Okay, well, let's take, a, let's take a look. I'll give you an example. Let's pretend you had these grades, David. Okay, so the lowest score here is 70, which means that this person would definitely have to take the final. So let's say they got, let's make it 70, 73 on the final what would happen is that 73 would replace the 70 and then all five of these scores will get averaged and that becomes the student's grade. Now let's say we'll use the same, use the same example. And the student gets 68 on the final, then all five scores get averaged and that becomes the student's grade. Okay. No, is, that, yeah. is that clear? Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. The, the, main, the main confusion I often see from students is they'll believe that the score gets replaced, but only four of them get averaged, but it's actually all five. So that's why, you know, if you do, well, and the other thing is you don't have to take the final. Nobody has to take the final per se. I mean, you can be happy with the grade you have, but if you understand that if you've got a C or less, you, you'll essentially have a zero in there and uh, that could drag your grade down by not taking the final. So anybody who is a C or less certainly should take the final or, or risk failing, that's for sure. If you don't take the final with a B, uh, will that drag your no, grade down? No, okay. it doesn't, no. Because if, if you've got a B, it's because you've got more than 80% on all four test scores. And you know, whether you take the final or not, it's not going to affect that. If you take the final and do, do well, you could raise it to an A though, which is what a lot of people try and do. Okay, all right, I got it. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? Anybody have any other questions? We're all cool with that. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's, this is the practice test and the real test you'll take is <coughs> the same as, as, as it was throughout this course, by the way. 
it's not some great mystery. You know, I, I think people would have a really hard time sending me an email and saying, oh, you know, you know what, Dr. Musgrave, I don't think you're, uh, I don't think your tests were transparent enough. I had no idea what I was going to see. Well, if, I, if you were to say that, I'd have to, I'd have to laugh at you because it's all here. It's just exactly the same thing. So you're going to get the same kinds of, you're going to get the same kinds of um, information like the molecular geometry sheet you have here, you'll have with the test, periodic table you'll have with the test. And let's see, is there anything? Yeah, this was the other thing. I did add in this MO diagram as well, right? That's to help with the MO questions. So you don't have to memorize that. All right. Does anybody have any questions so far? Could you cover one of the uh, Vesepper questions? Well, earlier I'm not, yeah, obviously I was going to do that, uh, but actually I'll, I'll do that in a second, David. Richard, okay. Richard, I, I didn't want to forget you because I put you off um, earlier. So it was question 21 and okay. it, was, it was about the lowest boiling point. So both of the diagrams were both VWD. Okay, but one of them was, okay, let, I'd have to look at it, but can I, can I take a guess at what it looked like? Yeah, one was a zigzag mm. and one was uh, three lines meeting in the middle at one yeah. point, and then one of those lines had a line off of it. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, so I, I, I'm going to recreate that for you, okay? Okay. So it looks, it looked like, oops, maybe that's a bit too long. That'd be one and the other one was probably something like this, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So they are both Van der Waal because they're all CH. Now this one here though is branched. And this one here is straight. And if you look in the notes, you'll see that branched is going to be lower boiling point because it doesn't pack as well. The straight is like going to pack like cigars in a box. So there's a lot of surface contact between the between the chains, whereas branched is more like spheres in a box. So there's not as much contact. And that applies for the other ones as well, like dipole, dipole. It, well, it, if they were both dipole, dipole, you could use that to distinguish between them, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, same with hydrogen bonding as well, if they were both hydrogen bonding. Okay. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. David, I'm going to go back to your question now. Okay. And after I've asked, answered the VSEPR question, I'll take any other questions anybody has. But you know, there's a number of parts to the VSEPR question. And it's really questions one through, one through 11 are all related to VSEPR. So the first one is going to be a Lewis structure question. And I'm just, I'm just gonna do one of these. I'll do the BRO two minus. Do the valence electrons, which is going to be seven plus two times six plus one, which is 20. So I draw the BR of the two O's on it. I fix up the O's and make sure they have eight electrons by adding six pairs, recognizing the bonds take up two electrons. So that would be a total of 16. I need to use 20. So I'll put two on top of the bromine, two on the bottom of the bromine. So the answer for this one would be, if it was double bonds, zero double bonds. If you were asked about non-bonding electron pairs or lone pairs, it would be one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Does anybody have any questions so far? Double bonds are when four different electrons are shared between two different atoms, right? Well, this would be an example. So if you had something like that, that would have one double bond, David. The double, the double line, oh, that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the other one, this, this one here doesn't have, doesn't have that. So you could either be asked for double bonds or lone pairs. So you need to be, you can, you can see it here, double bonds and then lone pairs, but they're for different ones, but you get the idea. Does anybody have any questions so far? I have a question. Yes, Haley. So I'm just a little confused about the double bonds. Like, how do you know when to like take one off one of the atoms and then make it a double bond? Okay. Can you see in this instance, I didn't have to because I'd used all 20 electrons. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay. So let me, let me give you an example. I'll use this one up here, NO2 minus as an example. So for this one, the valence electrons would be five plus two times six plus one, which would be 18. So I'd go ahead and and try and put all that together. So I put a total of eight around each of the oxygens. And then I've got two more and those will go on the nitrogen like that. And that's it, I've used all 18. Do you see that? Yes. So now you see that the nitrogen still isn't happy. It doesn't have eight electrons. So I have no choice but to take two electrons off one of the oxygens and have it share its electrons with the nitrogen as well, which is what's going to happen here. So I end up with one double bond to make that nitrogen happy. So basically you have to make sure the center atom is like full with the eight. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, but you'll only know that after you've used up all valence electrons that you calculate it. That's why it's so important to calculate them from the outset. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you have to do that every time. It's, uh, it's not something you'll be able to guess at. All right, does anybody have any other questions so far? That was a good question, Haley. thanks. Right, consider the following compound Cl31 minus. Or is it Ci3? No, it's Ci3, it's not Cl3 minus at all. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that's. Uh, In your I can't. I, I, I honestly can't tell. I think it would have to be CI because would you not need two elements for your uh, well to, to solve it? Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> you could, uh, I mean, that's a that's an actually a viable compound is Cl three minus. I actually never really thought about it. So in that instance, you know, that's something you'd want to email me about if you got confused with it, I guess. In the parentheses, it, it looks like it might be spaced in the parentheses. It, it is actually, but the reason for that is so that the screen reader reads it. It's just that with Arial, the, uh, the font Arial, it's not a serif font. So there's no real way to distinguish between a capital I and a lowercase l, which I think is a huge failing of the font myself. But that seems to be the font that gets used most often. So anyways, I guess sometimes it's just gonna be that way. All right, but I think it is CI three minus. All right, so valence electrons, that'd be four plus three times seven plus one, uh, 26, okay. So C and we've got three I's. 
pretty scary, isn't it? Three eyes. I'd rather have two eyes, thanks. And then we fix up the electrons around the eyes. And at this point, we've used 24. That means we've still got two left over. Those will go on the C. So, so Haley, I'm just going to say there, that's an instance where you don't have a double bond because you've used up all 26. Okay, I see, thank you. So CI3 minus there would be, would be what that would look like. Now you were looking for the overall shape. So what you would do here is you count how many objects are on the C and there are a total of four objects. Remember an object counts as an atom or a non-bonding electron pair. And if you're looking for the overall shape, then you're going to go back to the initial diagram that you're given here. And you'll look for the one that has four objects on it. And that'll give you the, that's tetrahedral, you can see. That'll be the overall shape. It looks like tetrahedral has five objects with the A. Is that not included? No, well, you, you're talking about objects connected to the central atom, David. So A, oh, is, well then, a is the central atom. Well, and then it would be C as a central atom, and then there's only three objects connected to it, right? No, no, three both, no, because the lone pair also takes up space. Oh, okay. All right, I got it. I now, remember, we're talking about the overall shape here. If you were talking about the, so that's overall, if you were asked for the shape of the atoms, that would be trigonal by, that's sorry, trigonal pyramidal. That's where you just look at the atoms, David. All right, I got it. That's the real distinction I want people to be able to make. So that's trigonal. So in this question, if you were only asking for the atoms, would it be trigonal pyramid? Or yes, that's right, Tri trigonal pyramidal. Pyramid. Yeah. And do you have to memorize that? No, it's right here in the test, <laughs> right? <laughs> Can everybody, now I'm going to stop here for a second. I just want everybody to be able to distinguish between what I mean by overall shape and the shape of the atoms. The overall shape is the first shape and all of our, you know, and then the other one just shows if you have uh, electrons on the central atom, right? Right, but you can't really see, you can't visualize or see the, like you can visualize the atoms, you can't really see the electrons. That's why the shapes are different. Can you do like one example of each? Like not example of each. Um... I'll do another example, but do, do, you, do, you, do you see the distinguishing fa factor here, Haley, or is there a question you have about it? I well, sorry. Let, let's, I'll ask Haley first. And I'll get you yeah. to you, Roland. Yes. Haley. Um. I just it's just hard. To, so basically, the two extra atoms onto the central one, like, are the another X for them. That makes it a tetrahedral overall. Yes, because it takes up space, just like the atoms do. So is that going to apply to like all of them with like extra ones on the central atom? Well, what I would say is that if for anything that has electrons on the central atom, it's always going to have a shape of atoms that's different from the overall shape. If you had four atoms connected to the central element, then the overall shape and the shape of the atoms would be identical. Okay. Is, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roland? Uh, I just had a general question. So I, they can form like the same elements, combinations, they can form different bond types, right? Or like different shapes. Well, depending on the number of electrons you have and what the little structure looks like, yes. 
Okay, so it, so if it, if it has a specific number of electrons and a specific number of um, bonds, it has to form a specific shape. It Absolutely. Doesn't... Now, the, the, the thought behind it is that if you've got four objects around a central element, they are going to want to be as far apart from each other as possible, and that's what's going to drive the shape. Okay. Because, like, I... I... I was trying to figure out because like um, I was practicing this at one point and I was saying like, oh, it could be this one or this one. No, it didn't, no, no, it shouldn't. It, it's always it shouldn't be that. Okay. No, okay. It, a, if, if you're thinking that it's because you're, you're mixing something up and it's probably the concept of overall versus shape of the atoms. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do this one. Haley, I think this might help with what your question was earlier. Okay. So the valence electrons on this one are going to be five plus five times seven, which is 40. And the idea would be to put the, the fluorines on here. I shouldn't really judge about where I'm putting them, but I'm just trying to justify what I'm doing here. So I fix up all the fluorines before I do that. And you'll notice I've used up all 40. So there are no more electrons put on the central atom because I've used up all 40 already. But the thing is, this has five atoms on it. So the overall shape would be this one, trigonal by pyramidal. But that would also be the shape of the atoms. So it's only when you have an electron pair on the central element that the shape of the atoms is different from the overall shape. Otherwise, it's going to be the same. Is, is that clear? Yes, that's clear. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Other questions about this? Now, this is a good discussion. I'm, I'm glad we had it because I think it, it helps clear up some uh, misconceptions. Anybody have any other questions so far? So uh, just to remember, it is there's two different questions for something very similar. They ask you what the atomic shape is, and then they ask you what the shape of the objects is. Is that what it is? Well, overall or shape of the atoms, I think of it too. Oh, okay. And so the overall shape is the shape of the atoms alongside the, the lone pairs. Right, because they, every, you, you want to take into account everything that takes up space, David. But in the case of the shape of the atoms, you're only considering the atoms. Okay, got it. Yeah. It's like here, I mean, this, this one, the overall shape is trigonal by pyramidal because it's got five objects, right? But the shape of the atoms is simply linear. Okay. Every, every one of these is essentially the shape of the atoms, every diagram. All right, any other questions? Okay, uh, let's look at, I feel like we, we've done enough with that. Let's look at the bond angles. Now you can see the list of bond angles here. And unfortunately, you know, there's, uh, there's no real, real way out but you do have the diagrams here for everything. And I think by looking at the diagrams, it's not, it's not difficult to come up with the bond angles on your own. So you can see for linear, that's obvious. That's an obvious one, that's 180 degrees. 
Trigonal planar, if you think of a circle, a circle is 360 and you've got three things in a circle. So 360 divided by three would be 120. So you know that those bond angles are 120. The one you might have to memorize, <coughs> you don't even really have to memorize that because it's in the list, is 109.5 for tetrahedral. So those bond angles are all 109.5. For the trigonal bipyramidal, this is a combination of linear and trigonal planar. So the linear bond angles are 180 and the ones in the plane here that I'm pointing at with my cursor, those are 120. And for the octahedral and the square planar, those are 90 and 180 on the bond angles. Does anybody have any questions about the, the bond angles? So we determine it but by looking at, what do we have to look at in it? Well, well you, have to, you have to look at the shape, the overall shape. To okay. Get bond angles. Right. So, so what, once you determine the overall shape, then you can calculate your bond angles. What would be the the bond angle of linear? Well, what about that one? Well, it's one hundred and eighty, right? I mean, yeah, you, flat line. It's okay. A straight line, right? What about <laughs> yeah. tetrahedral? What it's would you think that? One hundred nine point five. Okay. But but look but look here look here though you, you're given the you see see the list. You don't even oh, it really... gives us a, a list in order of each. Well, I see that. it gives you a list. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's in order, but <laughs> it gives you a list. Okay. Okay. And then you have to you pick you pick which one it applies to. So I mean, if you're looking at that list, 180 that's linear, 120 that would be trigonal plane, 109.5 that's tetrahedral, 120 degrees slash 90 that would be trigonal by pyramidal. 90 degrees would be square planar and 180 and 90 degrees would be uh, octahedral. Okay, yeah. All right, does anybody have any other, any other questions? I think I misspoke. I think you should look at the shape of the atoms to get the to get the bond angles. I apologize for that. Not the overall shape. Look at the shape of the atoms. And that'll give you the bond angles. The hybridization. Now the hybridization, now I'm not going to go into a deep explanation about this. If you want more information, you can watch the video where I talked about it. Or you can watch one of the mini lecture videos where I talk about this as well. But I don't want to go into the full spiel of this one. What I will say is that the what I will say is that the hybridization is going to be based on the on the overall shape of which whatever you pick up here. So XEBR2, you'd have to do the, the structure for that first. So that would be eight plus seven times two. So that would be 22, right? Eight plus 14, 22, yeah. Okay, a bond of BRs to the XE. Okay, that's a total of 16. And I need a total of 22. So I add three pairs to the, to the xenon. So I have to use up all 22 of these. So then you could see the overall shape here would be trigonal by pyramidal. And that's five objects. I have a question. Yeah. 
So what's the like total amount of electron pairs that you can put on the central atom before going doing the double bond? As many as, 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 many as you have to, Haley, to use up the, all those valence electrons. In some instances, you know, it, it's going to be the case that you'll need, you know, these are exceptions, you're, you're going to need more than eight. Sometimes you'll need less than eight. Okay. So the times when you'll need more than eight and when you have excess electrons after you've filled up all the outside ones. See, we'd already fixed up the BR. We, had to, we still had six electrons left over. All of them had to go on the XE. So one rule you can't violate is that you must use every last valence electron you calculated. Okay. So trigonal bipyramidal for this one, five objects, which means we need five hybrids. So we would need S, P, three, D. Like I said, I'm not gonna go into a deep explanation about this, it would take half an hour explain this whole thing from where to go so I want you to if you if you don't know what I'm talking about you're going to have to go back and take a look at it all right does anybody have any any other questions about that one so for this without the long explanation what you did was you you looked for the the shape the overall shape the overall shape and then once you got the overall shape shape you figured out how was there five hybrids what was that exactly because you got five objects oh right right okay so then you have five hybrids and five yeah. hybrids would be sp2d sp3d oh okay and that it's going in a list of one through five on the answers right there so. one through six two, two through six essentially all right got it so sp that'd be two SP2, that'd be three. SP3 is four. SP3D is five. SP3D2 is six. It's not that bad, is it, really? No, it's not. As far as like the hybridizations go, this is sort of like a comment. Um, I found this video that was like extremely helpful to me and I just wanted to post it in the chat for everyone if they wanted to use it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, Ron. Uh, that in the chart that you went over in one of the Zoom sessions, uh, also just memorize that. It will give well, you. It's, it's, I don't think you have to memorize it because you can see that the number of the number well, just, of orbitals. Just the trigonal bipyramidal uh, has you know five five well, groups. Do you really have to memorize it? It's right here. You can count. You can count the groups on that. I guess. Yeah, there's nothing to memorize. The number of orbitals is correspondent to the number of objects. So if you've got one plus three plus one is five. That's why I don't think it's that difficult, especially since it's all right there in front of you, right? It's right there, it's right in the list. Two, three, four, five, six. All right, any, any questions? Okay, so for something like number 11, we're looking at FGE, and we're looking for the dipole along the FGE bond. And the dipole always points to the more electronegative of the two atoms, so the, the arrow would look like that, which would be the left arrow. Does anybody have any questions about how to, how to get the dipole? So wait, how do we get the dipole again? Could you explain that one more time? The arrow goes along the bond parallel and goes towards the element that is more electronegative. And how do you figure out which one is more electronegative? Yeah, you use the periodic table. 
and whatever's closest to fluorine, fluorine's the most electronegative element, whatever's closest to fluorine will be more electronegative. Okay, got it. Uh, like I'm, David, I, I want to point out this is not this is not some kind of mystery where you know you're only figuring this out now because I I have talked about it in the in the past lectures. Okay, I just want you to be completely aware of that. Yeah, I know. I know. I can All go right. back and look yeah. at it. But... Okay, good. I just didn't want you to think that this was some sort of mystery that I'm only revealing to you right now. Okay. Yeah. So for this one, you're looking for the, the net dipole and that involves applying what we just did over here, but to a bit, bit of a greater degree. So I'm gonna redraw this. I'm not gonna show all those dashed lines and things, but those are just giving you an idea of the geometry. So we, again, we, we apply the, all the dipoles, we put them all on here. And based on what I've told you about the way these dipoles add together, if you've got them exactly opposite, they're going to cancel. So all we're left with is this one on the net, which would apply to north here. So that would be the net dipole. And again, I, I'd, I'd want you to go back and watch the dipole video if you have no idea what I'm talking about. All right, does anybody have any other questions about any of the those are that's all of the BSEPR questions. Does anybody have any questions about any of those? Um, on the practice test, there was the ones where you're looking at the graphs. Um, one of the answers was extremely like the question was extremely close. It was like, what uh, what's occurring at I believe it was. Uh, pressure 10 or 10 to the fifth and temperature 200 degrees Kelvin. And I couldn't tell if it was, you know, like on like done this one here, for example. Gases, or like if it was on the gas only. Was this, was this it here? 10 to the fifth and 200? Yeah, it was like that. Yeah. But well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I think it's pretty clearly gas. Because I, I couldn't, with my computer, if it looks like the 200 was a lot closer to the line, I, I don't know if that's just my computer, but. Well, you I could have enlarged. If you have any, was if you have any, gas, if you have any doubt, I, I, would, I would enlarge it. Use, okay. use command plus or control plus, depending on what computer you're on. Okay. And then control or command minus to, to bring it back to the original size. Okay, thank you. If you have any, if you have any doubt about that. But for... For the vast majority of them, it should be pretty clear what you're Yeah, what you're that was the for. only one that I had any problems trying to figure out uh, what the answer was. Okay. All right, does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Okay, well, I won't be able to have time to, to go through all the rest of them here. So um, if, does anybody have any other things they want me to go over in the last five minutes? you cover uh, number 22? Okay, number 22, let's have a look. Okay. So something like this one here. Well, for, for, for these questions, you have to be able to identify the intermolecular force. For the top one, it's going to be dipole, dipole. For the bottom one, it's going to be a van der Waal. And we're looking for the higher boiling point, so that would be the that would be the dipole dipole. So I mean, there's a lot more. <laughs> there's a lot more of it that goes into that. You have to you have to be really be able to look at them, look at all of them, be able to tell what into there's like a lot, There's a lot under the hood, but you understand yeah. it well enough to just compress it into that. Yes, that's what that's what I'm asking you to do. Yes. 
Okay. And again, you know, you're going to have to go back through the work. I mean, the thing is, I know what the reality is. I know what the reality is. I know that the vast majority of you have not looked at this at all. Yeah. <laughs> and I also know that many of you will not look at it until the day it's due. I mean, and you, you're going to try and get a whole four weeks of work in one day and your grade is going to reflect that. So, hey, I can't control any of that. So these, these, these questions, there is a whole lot more to them than just what I just did. I mean, you have, to, you have to understand how to get to that point. And that's what, this, that's what the whole point of me sitting here trying to tell you how to do that is. All right, thanks for explaining that. All right. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Could you do number 23 too? Yeah. All right, so number 23, we're looking at the highest solubility in, mm -hmm. in hexane. So C6H14, and that would be Van der Waal. And then the first one there, that, well, that's, uh, that's Van der Waal. And the other one is hydrogen bonding. So we look for the one that is most compatible because we're looking for the highest solubility and that would be, that would be Van der Waal. So that would be the answer, would be the first one. Thank you. Uh, but again, <laughs> there's a lot more to it. You have to, you have to be able to look at everything and be able to tell exactly what intermolecular forces at play. And I, I spent a lot of time on that in the mini lectures and on and in the class we talked about it. All right, any other questions? I have a question. Yes, Hayley. So is the final gonna be like a week after the test four? Uh, I believe this is this is what I this is what I know about the final. Get out of here. All right, so the final here. Uh, there, let me see if I've got it here. Here we go. All right, so it's you, it's not going, you have to start between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. On December seventh, okay. that's that's not to say it's only an hour. It's I think you get two hours for it. Might even be longer than that you get for it, but that's just when you have to start it. And how and, many questions? Well, look at if you look at the final study guide, that'll tell you. Oh, and right. is it like reflecting it basically? All right, let's have a look at what the final study guide says. There you go. Yeah, it clearly outlines. All right. So there you go. 13 questions. Test one and two. So you know, I, I, I give you even a, a range of questions which you can look at to study. All right. It's so transparent. Well, so it, it's not as transparent as people would like. But then again, you know, I want people to look at everything. I don't want them just to look at select things. I mean, you're telling us exactly which questions to study for on the tests. You're it's not telling us right. look at test two, test three, test four. So that's it. It's very transparent. So here you go. Uh, one hour, 50 minutes. I think I've got here, but I might give you, it's possible I give you longer for it being online and gives you a chance to put in the, uh, the working as well, if, that's, yeah. if that ends up yes. being an issue. I was going to ask the question about that for sure, because like, I know it takes me a while to like write out everything and make sure that everything's labeled property properly and stuff. It's kind of like what happened. Yeah, that one hour, 15 minutes is probably more reflective of the pencil and paper test. Let me, let me see. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly now how long it goes. Sorry, I'm going a little bit over here. I apologize for that. If anybody needs to leave, they can. Uh, let me take a look. What have I got here? Hundred and fifty minutes. Okay. 
That should be good. For a 13 question. <laughs> Thank you for specifying that. Okay, no worries. Okay, does anybody have any, any other questions? All right, yeah, go on. I'm, I'm sorry, Kendall? Do you know if there's gonna be a curve on the final? Probably there, not. Well, I, I, can, I can guarantee there won't be. I don't okay. curve anything because I don't have to. I, I sleep very well knowing that I've been as transparent as I can possibly be and I don't need to include a curve on anything. Because okay. if students haven't reached that standard, it's because they haven't put the work in to be blunt. It's as simple as that. Anybody who fails, they have nobody to blame but themselves. They can't blame me. And when, when, when people say, well, is there going to be a curve? What you're essentially saying is the instructor screwed up and made the test too hard. I mean, that's the implication. And I, I, don't, I just don't believe that that's true for me. All right, does anybody have any other questions? All right, well, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much. And I will, well, I, I, get, I guess this is it. I, 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 won't, I won't see you again until um, till next Wednesday. Right? There won't be class next Monday. There won't be class on this Wednesday because it's Thanksgiving. And yeah, so good luck. If you need me, you, you, know, you know how to contact me. Happy Thanksgiving. Same Thank to you, you all, and I'll, I'll catch you all later. Stay safe. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm all right, how are you doing? Except for this one thing that you want to talk about.